The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Reasonable Accommodations and Accessibility webinar, uh, part of our Fair Housing Month series of webinars. Uh, we are going to get started here in about five minutes, well, at about 2.05. So uh, don't worry if you don't hear anything before then. We just want to give everybody enough time to get in, get situated, and take care of any possible tech issues that always happen. The other thing that I'm going to do is I am going to be putting up a poll. If you don't mind, go ahead and answer that poll while we wait for the 205 mark. Uh, and we will, again, as I said, start at about 205. Okay, thank you all for answering the poll question. It looks like we have quite a few of you, almost half of our attendees are from either a nonprofit or an advocacy organization. And the rest of you seem to be from property management uh, or compliance staff for TDHCA monitored properties. We do have 23% who said none of the above. Um, if you don't mind, go ahead and in the questions box, maybe drop us a, a note that said, uh, tells us what, uh, what you're from, where you're from, why you're here. Uh, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Nathan Darris. I am the Fair Housing Research Specialist at the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, TDHCA. And I'm really excited that we've got so many of you here today. Uh, today's training is the 2021 Reasonable Accommodations and Accessibility Training. This is the second of, I believe, six or six trainings that we'll be giving this month as part of our Fair Housing Month series. Jeff, if you could move to the next slide. Great. So this is just a quick disclaimer. This material is based upon work supported by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development under the Fair Housing Initiatives Grant Program. Education and Outreach Initiative, FEOI 190455. 
Any opinion, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this material are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So before we begin today's webinar, just a few notes of housekeeping. We do want to let you know that all materials and the recording of this webinar will be available on the TDHCA website. Uh, and if you have any questions during the uh, webinar, please go ahead and drop them into the questions box. After every segment, we may try to answer questions that are in that box, and especially if they are relevant to the, the particular topic, we may also hold off on answering those until the end of the webinar. If your question is one that requires us to do a little bit of research, we will let you know and we will get you uh, get back to you by email after the webinar is over and we've had some time to get the research done. And then finally, this training is informational only and it does not satisfy the requirements in Texas Administrative Code, uh, 10 TAC 10.402 E1 through 2 for post bond closing documentation uh, for multifamily bond transactions. And it uh, does not um, does not satisfy the requirements for documentation submitted for the 10% test for housing tax credits either. Again, my name is Nathan Darris. I'm the Fair Housing Research Specialist here at the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. And with me is presenter Jeff Riddle today. Jeff with the Te Texas Workforce Commission Civil Rights Division. Jeff. Good afternoon, everybody. As Nathan said, my name is Jeff Riddle, and I am with the Texas Workforce Commission Civil Rights Division. My information is right there on the screen, and you will see this information again at the end, should you need it. So, as Nathan said, what we are here today, this is some of the things that we are going to cover. We're going to, again, as you know, the basis for everything that we do, we're going to look at the Federal Fair Housing Act and the Texas Fair Housing Act, uh, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and Section 504. And the main reason we're all here today, reasonable combinations and modifications. We're going to discuss that. We're going to analyze it. And we're going to give you some ins and outs for that. We're going to talk about some accessibility issues. And then we're going to close it out on if you have a complaint, the complaint procedures for both of our departments, the TDHCA and the Civil Rights Division, and some of the options that you get, like the mediation that comes with what happens when you file a complaint. These are the objectives that we're going to go over. It falls right along with our agenda, but so you have an understanding of where the basis for reasonable accommodations and modifications come from with inside the acts and how the complaint process works. So, as I said, we're going to start, we'll be discussing the federal and state laws and regulations that apply to reasonable accommodations and modifications in housing. So the Fair Housing Act, right, it is the cornerstone of civil rights history in this country. Uh, it represents Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968. The Federal Fair Housing Act is the policy of the United States to provide within constitutional limitations um, for fair housing throughout the entire U.S. No person shall be subject to discrimination because of their race, color, religion, sex, handicap. We use that term only because that is what is still within the acts, but it is actually has been redefined as disability, um, familiar status, or national origin. And that is covered in everything with inside housing, in the sale, rental, advertising of dwellings, and in the provisions of brokerage services or in the availability of real estate related transactions. So everything from listing a home to owning a home to renting a home, everything that has to deal with your home. Uh, CFR, as you see down there in the bottom, does stand for the Code of Federal Regulations, which is a document that contains all regulations published in the Federal Register and is divided into 50 sections. Housing and Urban Development is found in Title 24, uh, which is also where the majority of the Fair Housing Act regulations are located. 
And then we dial down and we get to the Texas Fair Housing Act. And originally the Texas Commission on Human Rights before Civil Rights Division within the TWC was founded, we had the Texas Commission of Human Rights and it was established by state legislature um, in 1983. And it was the authorizing agency to enforce the law and handle complaints filed under the commission or any complaint deferred by the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. When the Texas Fair Housing Act was passed by the legislature on May 25th, 1989, the commission was further empowered to enforce its provisions. So the commission was handling discrimination within employment and housing. Uh, on 1 September of 2015, the duties and the authority of the Texas Commission on Human Rights were transferred to the Civil Rights Division of the Texas Workforce Commission. Regulations for the Texas Fair Housing Act are found in the Texas Property Code and the Texas Administrative Code. The Texas Workforce Commission is the state agency in Texas responsible for the enforcement uh, of the Texas Fair Housing Act, even in TDHCA monitored uh, rental properties. The Workforce Commission enforces the Fair Housing Act and processes all fair housing complaints and mediation, uh, which of course we will discuss later on in this webinar at the end when we talk about complaints and mediation. So when it comes to the act, the basis of fair housing is to avoid and prevent discrimination. Discrimination is defined as a difference in treatment because of membership in one or more of the protected classes. There are these seven protected classes under federal and state law, and it's race, color, national origin, familial status, also known as your family status, religion, sex, and disability. The Texas and federal fair housing laws prohibit the basing of housing decisions on a person's protected class. It also prohibits the application of different standards to anyone because of their protected class. In addition, these laws prohibit harassing anyone based on a protected characteristic. These laws also state that you cannot retaliate against any applicant, tenant, buyer, or a consumer uh, for engaging in protected activities, such as complaining about their alleged discrimination, filing a discrimination complaint against a housing provider or a lender, or testifying, providing a statement, being a witness in hearings, investigations, or court proceedings, proceedings concerning discrimination complaints. Uh, for today, for the purpose of today's webinar topic, we will be focusing specifically on the protected class disability, as that is where the reasonable combinations and modifications come from. Oh, too far. There we go. All right. A disability um, is a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. It is a record of having impairment or being regarded as having an impairment. So the, obviously the mental or physical impairment substantially limiting one major life activity, we'll go into what constitutes major life activities. When somebody is, has a record of an impairment, that means that they have a history of having such an impairment. Not all impairments are an active part of everybody's lives, they could come and go. And that's what having a record of an impairment is. By being regarded, that's meaning being treated as having an impairment when in, the individual does not, or if that impairment li limits um, a major life activity and it does not. In addition to the laws covering a buyer or renter with a disability, uh, the following persons are covered, and that's a person residing in, or intending to reside in the dwelling after it's sold, rented, or made available, and any person associated with the buyer or renter. That is a, you know, a person who is covered. So as I said, what are some of those major life activities that one or more? You got caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning, and working. 
And again, a disability can affect one or multiple of these major life activities. So some common impairments that we see that do affect those major life activities are right here. Um, the fair housing laws do protect persons who are recovering from substance abuse, as you see the last ones, um, but they do not protect persons who are currently engaging in the current illegal use of a controlled substance. So the drug addiction and alcoholism, um, that is somebody that's in a you know, recovery program, not a current illegal drug user for the drug addiction. Additionally, these laws do not protect an individual with a disability whose tendency would uh, constitute a direct threat to the health or safety of other individuals or uh, results in the substantial physical damage to property of others unless the threat can be eliminated or significantly reduced by a reasonable combination. Uh, and of course, you know, this list is not exhaustive. Um, this is just some examples. The act does not allow for the exclusion of individuals with disabilities based upon fear, speculation, or stereotype about a particular disability or persons with a disability in general. Um, however, the act does not protect an individual. Um, I've already talked about the direct threat. And if a question does arise regarding the direct threat, because it is important, a determination that an individual poses a direct threat must rely on an individualized assessment that is based on a reliable objective evidence. Uh, the assessment must consider the, the nature, duration, and severity of the risk of injury, the probability that an injury will actually occur, and whether there are any reasonable accommodations that would eliminate the direct threat. Uh, consequently, in evaluating a recent history of overt acts, a provider must take into account whether the individual has received intervening treatment or medication that has eliminated the direct threat um, or the significant risk of substantial harm. Uh, in such a situation, the provider may request that the individual document how the circumstances have changed so that they no longer possess a direct threat or pose a direct threat. A provider may also obtain satisfactory assurances that the individual will not pose a direct threat during their tenancy. The housing provider must have a reliable objective evidence that a person with a disability poses a direct threat before excluding them from housing on that basis. So, um, as we continue to reference the, the Fair Housing Acts, both the federal and the, the Texas, um, they are very similar. There's not a major difference between them, so I'm probably going to refer to them as the Acts. Uh, we will be referencing the text of the Fair Housing Amendments Act of 1988, which amends the Civil Rights Act of 1968 to include further definition of discriminatory housing practice and includes the addition of disability and familiar status to the list of protected classes. The act was signed into law in September of 1988 as an amendment to Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act, also known as the Fair Housing Act. Um, it became effective March 12, 1989, and extends housing protection to persons with disabilities and families with minor children. It is enforced by HUD, and then in turn by Civil Rights Division here in the state of Texas as well. There are five other additional fair housing agencies that are substantially equivalent to federal law, and that's within the cities of Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Garland, and Corpus Christi. Um, if you have a complaint and you're watching this webinar and you live in one of those cities, the first people you go to is your local city's fair housing office. Another federal law that applies to reasonable accommodations and modifications is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Section 504 is the first federal civil rights protection for individuals with disabilities. 
It was drafted in 1973 and took effect in 77. It's the first federal civil rights protection for individuals with disabilities. It states that no otherwise qualified individual with handicaps in the United States shall solely by reason of his or her handicap be excluded from the participation in, being denied the benefits of, being subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And again, the term handicap is there. We have moved away from that and it's turned it disability, but for the purpose of this, it's still listed that way in the law. Just know that anytime we refer to handicap, it also refers to disability. So under section 504, uh, it does have specific guidelines, requirements and restrictions for all housing programs and providers who fall under the purview of section 504. And they are found in 24 CFR sections 8.4 and 8.53, if you would like to look those up. If not, here's a, you know, some requirements for you. Uh, you are required to make and pay for reasonable structural modifications to units and or common areas, operate housing that is not segregated based on disability unless authorized by federal statute or executive order, provide auxiliary aids and services necessary for effective communication, perform a self-evaluation of the owner's programs and policies to ensure that they do not discriminate based on disability, develop a transition plan to ensure that structural changes are properly implemented, operate programs in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of the qualified persons with disability, provide the newly constructed or rehabilitated housing, including a 5% of units, a one un there is a one unit minimum there, uh, are accessible for persons with mobility impairments, and 2% of units be accessible for persons with hearing or vision impairments. So basically in a housing development with 100 units, five must be accessible for people with mobility impairments and two be accessible for people with hearing or vision impairments. If the development has only 10 units, one must be accessible for individuals with mobility impairments and hearing or vision impairments. And then the last one, if you employ 15 or more, you must designate at least one person to coordinate Section 504 compliance and adopt grievance procedures that incorporate due process standards and provides for prompt equitable resolution of complaints from applicants for employment or housing and residences. The Section 504 prohibitions. And again, this is found in 24 CFR. But we have them listed right here for you. And that is denying the opportunity to participate in a program, service, or activity due to anyone's disability. Deny or refuse to rent housing to a person with a disability because of a disability. Impose tenant selection criteria fees or conditions that are different from those required of or provided to persons who do not have disabilities. Require persons with disabilities to live on certain floors or in certain areas of the community. Refuse to make repairs or limit access to public or common areas, parking privileges or services available to other residents. Deny opportunities to persons with disabilities to participate on advisory or planning boards. So these requirements and prohibitions are applicable to all housing programs except mortgage insurance, loan guarantee, uh, but does not include the home programs and community development block grant programs. Uh, Section 504 does also cover employees of federally assisted housing, as well as applicants and tenants. And Section 504 did pave the way for the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. 
which is our next line. So the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law in, on July 26th of 1990. It does provide protection against discrimination based on disabilities in many areas of life in the United States. It is divided into five titles. Title two and three apply to fair housing out of the five. Title two covers non-discrimination on the basis of disabilities by public entities. Uh, and a public entity is any state or local government, uh, any department, agency, special purpose district, or other instrumentality of a state or local government. This does include public housing authorities and the National Railroad Passenger Corporation or any other commuter authority. The Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act covers the public and common use areas at housing developments. When these public areas are by their nature open to the general public and when they are made available to the general public. An example, it covers the rental office, since by nature that rental office is open to the general public. In addition, if a daycare center or a community room is made available to the general public, it would be covered by Title III. Title III applies um, irrespective of whether the public and common use areas are operated by a federally assisted provider or a private entity. If the community room or the daycare center mentioned were only open to residents of that building, Title III would not apply. So if you need a key card to get in there, it's not generally open to the public. But you don't need a key card usually to get into the property manager's apartment manager's office. Is a good example of that. And then wrapping up all the rules, regulations, policies, everything that encompass and give us everything that are bases for reasonable accommodations and modifications is the Housing and Urban Development and Department of Justice Memorandum on Reasonable Accommodations and Modifications. And basically, the, they released a memo back in 2004. Um, and a memorandum on reasonable modifications in 2008. We'll explain the difference here in a minute between accommodations and modifications. And both memorandums clarify questions regarding the implementation of the law, including clarification on the verification of a need for reasonable accommodation or modification for an individual with a disability. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of today. Reasonable accommodations and modifications. Jeff, if we have a second, we did have a question related to protected class and protected status. Okay. Uh, seems like a good time to catch it. Uh, the question was, tenants who have disabilities who also happen to have uh, sexual orientation that may be gay or lesbian, are they still protected? And a follow-up on that was for people who are uh, gay or lesbian and have HIV, are they still protected? So, yes, I mean, and you can belong to one or more protected classes. Uh, a disability is a disability, no matter the protections. Now, as of January of this year, President Biden signed an executive order streamlining that, or not, but bringing the um, fair housing uh, um, rights and regulations in line with the recent Supreme Court decision of last year of Bostock versus Clayton County and having gender orientation and sexual identity included into the sex protected class. He signed so, that executive order in January requiring all agencies to ensure that they were including those in their sex protected class, gender identity and sexual orientation as bases of discrimination. And so you are now protected under that 
protected class based on those new guidelines? So basically to, to sort of give the quick answer to what seemed like a long question is that not only would tenants who have disabilities uh, still be protected because of their disability regardless of their, their sexual orientation, um, the Bostock memo or uh, Executive Order 13988 added sexual orientation and sexual preference as protected under sex in one of the original protected classes. And I think that's all the questions we have right now for, for this section. Okay. Just let me know if there's more questions that pop up. Um, we will move into, as I said, reasonable combinations and modifications. So what are reasonable combinations and modifications? Uh, a reasonable combination is a change, exception, or an adjustment to a rule, policy, practice, and or service. An example of this is a reasonable accommodation is making an exception to a property's pet policy to accommodate for a, a tenant's assistant animal. A apartment complex has a policy, no animals, or no pets, I should say, um, and you are requesting an exception to this policy because you have a service animal. And so you're changing the rules, making exceptions to those rules, policies, or procedures is an accommodation. A modification is a structural change to a dwelling or common area. An example would be adding accessible ramps uh, or adding accessible parking spaces with inside a housing home complex. Under the Texas Fair Housing Act, it is unlawful for any person to refuse to make a reasonable accommodation or modification in rules, policies, practices, or services when such an accommodation may be necessary to afford a person with a disability equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling. So it's important to remember on this one, um, a housing provider cannot refuse. We will get into denying, but they can't outright refuse to make a reasonable accommodation or modification. So getting in a little bit more to each. In general, you must provide all reasonable accommodations requested unless doing so would result in a fundamental alteration of the program or an undue financial and administrative burden. If, um, if you ever refuse a request because it is not reasonable, you should get engaged in an interactive conversation to seek an alternative accommodation. With the undue financial and administrative burden, there's no one mark on the wall that says, once you cross this line or this monetary amount, it becomes that financial and administrative burden. It is on a case-by-case -case basis. A lot goes into that. Your, your providers, how much money they bring in, what their business looks like, their operating model. So somebody that rents out four or five homes or townhomes is different from a multi um, conglomerate apartment complex. So there's not one mark on the wall. Just know that there is, that would be looked at by a case by case basis. And you know, it's always important because to have that interactive process, that one person might want to have escalators put into their two story townhome, but you might be able to provide one of those stair lifts instead because they we're only thinking of one thing and you can provide something else. So it's always good to engage in that interactive process to come to a reasonable ground. I mean, some comments that we have heard in the past when it comes to reasonable accommodations is housing providers stating we have to charge you 
extra for your service dog. Or we don't, we can't talk to people who call us over a relay service. The only accommodation we offer is disabled parking. That's it. We can't offer anything else. Um, we can't waive the breed of that animal, even if it is a service animal. And, or no, your assistant animal is not allowed in the pool area. And then another one we've heard is we have to charge you an additional transfer fee and deposit for that first floor unit. So if somebody has a recent mobility impairment and is moving from a higher story apartment down to the first floor due to not being able to navigate stairs, incurring extra transfer fees and deposit fees for that move as an accommodation. And again, these are all things we have, we have heard in complaints that have come to our agency. When it comes to reasonable modification, uh, if a tenant does have a disability, again, a landlord cannot refuse to let that person make reasonable modifications to that dwelling or common use area if it is necessary for that person to use the housing and the modifications are done at that person's own expense. For example, a tenant who is a wheelchair user requires uh, request to build a ramp for entry steps to their unit, it would be illegal to deny that request if the tenant is going to do the work at their own expense. And then when they move, they take that ramp and they return any maybe possible damage or they return everything back to its original conditioning. In the case of a rental, the landlord may where it is reasonable to do so, conditionally permit a modification if the renter agrees to restore the interior of the premises to the condition that existed before the modification, with the exception of reasonable wear and tear. The landlord may not increase a customarily required security deposit for individuals with disabilities. So you can't increase a security deposit because somebody is going to put in a modification. However, where it is necessary to ensure with reasonable certainty that funds are available to pay for the restorations at the end of the tenancy, the, the landlord may negotiate, negotiate as part of such restoration agreement, a provision requiring that the tenant pay into an, into an interest bearing escrow account. And that does come out of Texas administrative code. Uh, and again, it's negotiate, it's not has to pay into. Uh, there are some modifications, such as a sign for an assigned parking space that the Department of Justice has said landlords must pay for because of the cost is de minimis. As a condition for granting a renter permission for a modification, a landlord may require a reasonable description of the proposed modification, reasonable assurances that the work will be done in a workmanlike manner, and assurances that require building permits will be obtained. If it's a bigger undertaking than to install a simple ramp, the renter will be required to obtain all permits, pay for everything, and make sure everything is done professionally. So, what do the acts require? We've talked about what a reasonable combination is and a modification. The acts, both Texas and federal, do require that policies, practices, and services um, may have different effects on persons with disabilities than other persons. So treating persons with disabilities exactly the same as others would sometimes deny them an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. So, you have to make, you know, you can't outright refuse to make reasonable accommodations and modifications. Now, the biggest term in here is that may be necessary to afford persons with disabilities an equal enjoyment and use. And that may be necessary is important because it shows that there must be a nexus, um, a relationship between the specific disability and what is being requested. So a person you know, with the mobility dis disability 
who is in a wheelchair, who is asking for an assigned parking space now, or a wheelchair ramp they want to have installed. There is a nexus between what that disability is and what that disability related request is. So there has to be that. If there is not a nexus, a causation between the two, then it's not a reasonable accommodation or modification request. And of course, why would we grant these? And I mentioned it earlier, and it's because they do have, you know, having the same rule for everybody does not allow equitable treatment. Just because you have the same rule and it says, oh, I'm treating everybody equally because everybody has the same rule, but that could have different effects on persons with disabilities. So by granting that reasonable accommodation, you are allowing that person the equal use of a dwelling that they wouldn't normally have due to their disability. When it comes to rules for reasonable accommodation requests, and again, these come out of everything we discussed earlier, and the most important one that I can relay and get across to everybody is accept verbal request. This comes out of that HUD Department of Justice memorandum. You do not have to use a magic word. Uh, you do not even have to use the word reasonable accommodation request. You can simply state that I need a parking space closer to my building because I am now using an assisted walking device. That's all you have to say, and that is a reasonable accommodation request. Now, places might have websites, specific forms, certain programs that they would like you to use to make those requests. And I encourage those, as always, for a good record of that process between both the housing provider and the consumer. But that is not the only way you could do it. I'm not going to accept your request because you did not go on to our self-help web or you know, program and fill out a reasonable accommodation request, the same as you would a work order. It is not the be-all, end-all. So if there's the most important thing for rules on reasonable accommodation requests, is that they can come in any way, shape, or form and do not have to use specific terminology. Once that request has come in through any means, you know, immediately begin that interactive process. Carefully draft, review, and revise policy on a regular basis. So always look at your reasonable accommodation request. They could change and update. Ask for appropriate, reliable, disability-related information. And we will get to that, what you can and cannot ask for. Provide prompt responses and document all actions and interactions. So again, yes, it can be verbal, but then put them on a computer and say, hey, can you fill out this request form? I got it, we're gonna process it. That and also do not delay the interactive process. Oh, I gotta send this off to our lawyers or the property manager who's in another city and you don't respond back to that tenant for weeks or months on end, because that could also be looked at as a delay and allow for a complaint of discrimination to happen. So if, as long as there's an interactive process and it is actively being worked, you will not have a problem. When it comes to asking for that appropriate, reliable disability information, if, if you know what the disability is and you know, see what their disability related need is, there is no, you cannot ask for any further verification. And then on the complete other end of the spectrum, if you do not know what it, that person has a disability, so obviously if you do not know they have a disability and you do not know what that disability related need is, you can get verification from a healthcare provider documenting what the disability is and that disability related need is. And another rule we have here, TDHCA does have guidance that indicates that a reasonable accommodation should be processed in a reasonable time. For TDHCA programs like the Emergency Solutions Grant Program 
uh, a reasonable processing time is immediate. Otherwise, as you see, they do have um, a not to exceed 14 calendar days. Uh, it's not business days, it's not work days, it's 14 calendar days, so it's including the weekends. And so if you fall under TDHCA programs, you have a, a specific timeline in order to uh, respond to a reasonable accommodation request. So we have an example here of a request for a reasonable accommodation. A housing provider has a policy requiring tenants to come to the rental office in person to pay their rent. A tenant has a disability that gives her anxiety about leaving her unit. Because of her disability, she requests that she be permitted to have a friend mail her rent payment to the rental office as a reasonable accommodation. Everybody can kind of think about this one for a minute. Probably on the nose. Everybody's probably going to get this one because I know everybody that's watching this is has got this. Right? And so in this situation, that housing provider must make an exception to its payment policy to accommodate this tenant. So, some reactions and inquiries to avoid. So, what should you not do when you receive a request for a reasonable accommodation or modification? Right? You cannot ordinarily ask the nature and severity of an individual's disability. Again, as I said, you can get that there is a disability. You just can't get the nature and severity of a disability. You can also, um, if an applicant has a disability or if a person intending to reside in a dwelling or anyone associated with an applicant has a disability, is not a question to ask. You're a property manager and or you've gone to a property manager and they're like, do you have a disability? Is anybody going to be living with you have a disability? Is not something that should be asked. Again, there are some exceptions. As we stated, there are some disabilities. And because of some of those disabilities, say recovering alcoholics, and there is a specific um, home house recovery program where they're living in one area and so it is specifically designed for people with that disability then yes you can ask if they have a disability because that is a purpose of those home units so what inquiries can i make if a resident asks for a reasonable accommodation as i stated so a housing provider may ask for information relevant to determining if a requested reasonable combination is necessary because of a disability. For a disability that is not obvious or the need is not obvious, the housing provider may request reliable related disability information that does verify that the person meets the act's definition of a disability, describes the needed accommodation, and shows the relationship between the person's disability and the need for the requested accommodation. Uh, a doctor or other medical professional, a peer support group, non-medical service agency, or a reliable third party who is in a position to know about the individual's disability may also provide verification of a disability. And again, with this one, where it's not so obvious, does fall more in line with the, you know, the mental health, the not just mental health, but the those unseen disabilities that we saw earlier, PTSD, depression, autism, right? Some of them you're not gonna be able to see, and you may not know that by looking at that person, but then they come to you with a reasonable accommodation request. And so now you would get documentation that shows that, yes, this person does have PTSD and requires the use of an emotional support animal which to give the quick plug out, we will have later this week on Thursday. If you would like to know more about emotional support animals and service animals, please come to that webinar where we will do a deep dive 
into that subject because it is a lot more involved than just the surface. But that is a good example of needing documentation and getting verification of a disability and that disability related need and how they match. So on our next example, a tenant with a disability makes a request for a reasonable accommodation to the apartment manager for an early termination of their lease because they're going to be hospitalized for treatment due to their disability. So again, how should a manager respond? Is this a reasonable request? Give you a minute to think it over, or a couple of few seconds as everybody's thinking. Hopefully everybody got this right, because I know y'all are all smart, so I know you did. But the answer on this one, what happened was a manager denied the reasonable accommodation. And this was actually a complaint that happened in 2017 that uh, consumer filed a complaint against the property manager. And the settlement terms of the agreement, the property agreed to refund the tenant's rent for three months. The tenant agreed to vacate the unit and the property agreed to take fair housing training. Usually if there is a fair housing complaint, there's always a public interest aspect to it and they will receive some fair housing training so they don't have issues going forward in the future. So as I stated before, you cannot refuse a reasonable accommodation or a reasonable modification request. But when can you deny that request? You, you have to accept it. You can't just outright refuse it, but there are times when you can deny it. And it's under the following conditions. If a housing provider has reliable, objective evidence that a person with a disability poses a direct threat to others, including their service animal. Say a person has a, you know, we're not in Florida, but it has happened before where Somebody had an emotional support animal that was a crocodile alligator, one of the two. I can never remember which one or the difference between the two down in Florida is. But that posed a direct threat to others. There was also a case where a per person had a lemur as a emotional support animal. And this lemur had repeatedly had four instances of biting other people. Um, within the, the complex, and so it could be denied because that animal posed a direct threat based off the history of biting other people. Again, if there is no disability-related need for that accommodation, so again, remember there has to be a nexus. You can't ask for an elevator to be put into your apartment because you have a disability of being a, in a recovering alcoholic program. There's not a need between the two. So there's gotta be a disability related need, remember that nexus. And also if, a, if it's not reasonable, consider whether they're all alternative accommodations that would effectively address the requests disability related need. Like I said, that person who comes to you and says, I want an elevator or an escalator, to be put into the apartment complex or into my home and you can provide one of those stair lifts as a means to still accomplish the same goal. It just wasn't the intended initial request. And that's why the interactive process is very important. So when it comes to modifications, because modifications, remember, do change um, a structure or a dwelling. Who pays for that? Um, so housing providers may claim an undue financial and administrative burden. Remember, that's different. It's case by case. Or that a requested accommodation or modification constitutes a fundamental alteration of their operations. So you got to look at these considerations. Um, the financial resources of the provider the cost of the reasonable accommodation or modification, the benefits to the requester for that accommodation or modification, 
the availability of other less expensive alternative accommodations that would effectively meet the applicant or resident's disability related need. It's important to note that for TDHCA funded developments with federal or state funds, um, or they were awarded tax credits after 2001, the owner is responsible for paying for that reasonable accommodation or modification unless it is a fundamental change to the operations or again, it's that undue financial administrative burden. So if you're within inside one of those TDHCA funded developments, then you will pay for that accommodation modification. If not, it is on that tenant's responsibility to pay for it. In a nutshell, if you have not all of your income comes from your tenants, it comes from other sources, TDHCA, grants, funds, tax credits, is a good measure of where who is going to pay for a modification or accommodation. And these are some things to think about when it comes to determining also who pays for it. Is it a single or multifamily dwelling? Does that property receive federal financial assistance? When was the property built for first occupancy? For multifamily dwellings, if it's an accessibility, multifamily dwellings built after 1991 were built with accessibility in mind. So multifamily dwellings built before 1991 would fall under this when it was first built for occupancy because they weren't built with accessibility in mind. So you would basically be bringing them up to code for multifamily dwellings. Um, again, does the property participate in a low income housing tax credit program, like one of the TDHCA programs? What type of accessibility feature is being requested? And does the, is there an agreement that exists between the parties? If there was already an agreement made between the parties, then that agreement would determine who pays for that modification. When it comes to Section 504 um, and TDHCA's Low housing, Income Housing Tax Credit, I'm going to actually turn this over to Nathan, who is from the TDHCA and can explain this a lot better than I can. Nathan. Absolutely. So uh, many of TDHCA's properties will be subject additionally to uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Specifically, if you receive any of uh, the department's home uh, emergency solutions grant, na neighborhood stabilization program, any HUD funds through the department, and if, or I should say, or, if you uh, were awarded low-income housing tax credits after 2001, then you are subject to Section 504 requirements. In those cases, if you are subject to Section 504, you would be required to provide and pay for reasonable modifications that would be including structural modifications to dwelling units or public and common use areas, as long as those do not amount to an undue financial and administrative burden or are not a, or do not constitute a fundamental alteration of the nature of service of the program. A little bit more about TDHCA accessibility. Uh, according to Texas Administrative Code 10 TAC 1.204, uh, a recipient that owns either a low-income housing tax credit, multifamily bond development with no federal or state funds that is awarded before September 1st, 2001, still would need to allow for a reasonable accommodation, but does not need to pay for said reasonable accommodation, unless the accommodation requested should have been made as part of the original design and construction requirements under the Fair Housing Act, or is a reasonable accommodation identified by the U.S. Department of Justice with a de minimis cost. Those would be things like allowing service or assistance animals with no deposit and no pet rent, or having assigned parking spots. And there may be other small modifications that would fit under that. It is very situation specific. So in general, 
denial of reasonable accommodations most often occur due to misunderstandings of what reasonable accommodations are and how they work and who is required to make them. So that was all very, very complicated, particularly determining who pays. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Jeff, do not worry if you cannot read this. This is very small on the screen, I am well aware, but this is a flowchart that shows who would need to pay for a reasonable modification, and this comes to us thanks of the Fair Housing Council of Greater San Antonio. Um, you can see that at the, down at the bottom, uh, you see where the low-income housing tax credits awarded after 2001, the owner of the property does need to pay for a modification, whereas if it was low-income housing tax credit awarded before 2001, then that would not make that cut. But if you have federal funds on the property, like I said, HOME or ESG, NSP, uh, any of those would require you to pay for reasonable modifications in those cases. Okay, so we do have quite a few questions. Unsurprisingly, reasonable accommodations usually gets a lot of questions. Um, Jeff, I'm gonna I'm gonna toss a couple of these to you, and then I'm gonna I can handle a couple of them as well. But also, feel free to tag me in if you want some additional help. Um, the first one is a little bit strange. I don't think I've ever heard this question before, but it is a good question. Does the Fair Housing Act require assistance animals to be allowed at open houses at properties for sale, say like a single family house? Um, I'm actually looking for that question right now. To... It came in very early. Okay, let's see. Does the Fair Housing Act require assistant animals to be allowed at open houses for properties for sale? Um, that, so I mean, I, I would think, you know, if it's a service animal, ooh. <laughs> that one I might actually have to just do a little research because I'm not sure how to define an open house if it would be a public space and then fall under the ADA because it is a open house. So it is open to the general public at that time and not ooh, a residence. Um, that one I might have to come back but it, to. The other, the other question that I would have, and this would even um, put it under the Fair Housing Act, and, and again, this is not a strict answer. We are not attorneys. We cannot give you legal advice. Um, <laughs> but a, another way to look at this would be that it would be a an undue – it would be burdensome on a person who required an assistance animal. Uh, to disallow the the assistance animal when touring a home for sale. Um, while we usually handle rental properties, uh, you know, sale of properties is also covered by the Fair Housing Act. So this is one that, you know, we are going to go ahead and do a little bit of research on, and we will get back to you with an answer on this. Okay. Uh, another question that came in, Jeff, when a reasonable accommodation is made for a temporary disability, uh, is the property required to continue giving the accommodation or modification even if the tenant no longer has the disability? So example one, the tenant has a broken leg and was given reserved parking. They no longer wear the cast, uh, so it seems clear that the disability is over. Uh, the temporary disability, can they tell, can the property tell this individual that they no longer qualify for the reserved spot? And again, what would come down to that is, remember there has to be maybe necessary to enjoy 
equal use of dwelling and common use areas and may be necessary. So there has to be a nexus between a disability and a disability related need. If there is no longer a disability, then there is no longer a disability related need because there is no disability. So there would be in their right for a, if there is no longer a disability, then to go back to normal operations because there is no longer a disability, thus a disability related need between the two. Uh, another follow-up question to this, and Jeff, I do not know the answer to this. My, mm -hmm. I, I generally do not deal in t uh, disabil disabilities that are temporary. How do you define a temporary disability, and does a temporary disability actually qualify for a reasonable accommodation? Yes. So, again, it, whether it's a permanent or a temporary disability, a disability does have to affect one or more of those major life activities. So in that other case, a, a broken leg and now you are on crutches for the next month or so does affect a person's ability to walk and maneuver around. So that would be a disability and would allow for a disability related accommodation. Now, once that disability, again, has gone away because it is a temporary disability, then there is no more causation between the two. But it doesn't matter whether it's temporary or permanent. A disability that affects a major life activity is a disability. But the temporary and permanent aspect of it is the deciding factor on you know, if that accommodation goes away or stays through the remains of that person's tenancy in their dwelling. Uh, okay, so a uh, couple more questions here. I think um, I can cover these. What if a tenant is asking for an a assigned spot parking space in an apartment complex with limited parking? So say the apartment has 70 apartments and 62 parking spaces. Um, what do you do when a majority of tenants have handicap placards? The answer to this is you treat each and every reasonable accommodation on its own. And if more accommodations are asked for later, you treat them as they come, one at a time, and you treat them individually. Uh, there's no, there's no, I only need to give out five parking spaces before, uh, before there aren't any left. It is going to be. Um, you know, as long as you have someone requesting uh, an assigned spot and there is a disability related need for that uh, particular accommodation, you need to treat it as it is, uh, as, I don't know, you know, as an individual request. Uh, the next question is if a tenant um, asks for a larger room because the unit next to them makes too much noise. Um, or we changed, uh, you know what, this is a very specific question, and it, you, <clears throat> if you have very specific questions or very specific situations, uh, it's, there's no way for us to be able to actually answer that, um, because it's, there's, it's going to depend on an awful lot of things. So if you have specific questions, go ahead and email them to us, uh, either at fair.housing at tdhca.state. TX.US, or we can email Jeff. Jeff, what's your uh, email for questions? Uh, yes, and it'll be at the end, but it's also crdtraining at twc.state.tx.us. Okay, and then I'm going to do one more question here, which is um, who can be considered a reliable third party for uh, validation? of either disability or disability related need. Jeff, do you want to cover that or I can get that? Um, and yes, uh, a reliable third party, I always default and the best thing to do when it comes to, you know, verifying a disability and disability related need is going to be a healthcare provider 
and it's and that it offers no wiggle room in, involved in that aspect for a going back and forth and verifications because a, a housing provider is can get verification right when you provide them a letter with a disability disability related need they can get verification um, so a a friend when they're trying to verify that is not necessarily going to be that but a family member could be and do you have anything to add to that um, usually what what we would say is that uh, you know a reliable third party would be uh, uh, medical professional uh, who has a working relationship with the requester uh, or anybody who is in a position to know about the disability and disability related need of the individual. So theoretically, yeah, uh, a family member might be in that position. Uh, a social worker may also be in that position. Um, and then obviously any, any medical professional, doctor, nurse, psychiatrist, psychologist, uh, that's working with the individual would also be in a place to know. So, um, yeah, there's not a hard line, um, but I, I would say that the closer to the person and then, or the closer to a medical professional you get, the, 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 the more reliable the verification would be. Um, in fringe cases, I, I you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to make that choice yourself. And I would, I would absolutely, uh, I would absolutely seek legal counsel in those fringe cases. Um, a follow-up question to that was, can we require who fills out a verification form? No, you cannot require specific information. Um, you can only require that a person who fits the description so uh, an individual who would be in a position to know of the existence and disability related need uh, for the individual or a medical professional who has a professional relationship in that capacity as well. But you cannot require specific people to fill out a form, fill out a request or a verification form. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to accessibility. We'll, we, we'll try to come back to some of these other questions at the end. All right. All right, so design and construction requirements when it comes to accessibility. So as I referred to earlier, as a refresher, for all covered multifamily dwellings that were built for first occupancy after March 13, 1991, they have to be designed and constructed in a manner that is accessible, which means a place that can be used, entered, or reached, and usable, which is available or convenient for use. And in practice, these terms are interchangeable, really accessible and usable. So some design and construction requirements. Covered buildings should have at least one building entrance on an accessible route unless it is impractical because of unusual characteristics of the site. You know, unusual characteristics have to be determined and documented before, not after um, an issue is brought up uh, or the property is built. Uh, public and common areas that need to be accessible include laundry facilities, fitness centers. If there's a theater facility, playgrounds, and then some of your areas like fire alarms being able to be reached and accessible, mailboxes, storage area, access to a pool if there is one, activity center, recreation center, workout center if there's one, dumpsters and trash cans, and also light switches, electrical outlets, thermostats, environmental controls, and accessible locations. Reinforcement in bathroom walls, so grab bars can be added when needed. And usable kitchens and bathrooms, so that an individual in a wheelchair can maneuver about the space. 
when it comes to terms and conditions, it is illegal to set different terms, conditions, or privileges for sale or rental because of a disability. An example of that would be a housing provider may not treat disabled tenants differently when it comes to issuing lease violations uh, because, that, because of the disability of that person. So they're treating them differently than everybody else. Uh, or a housing provider may not require a disabled person to sign an extra addendum to use the pool at the property. We actually, an example of that, we had a case where somebody had a sensitivity to the sun and light and they requested to use the pool after hours. The pool was closed and locked at 10 o'clock. They were requesting to use that pool after that time because they didn't want to be out in the sun. And we know here in Texas, summers can last well into the night. So then the property wanted to add an extra addendum to that person's lease agreement where they were going to have to pay for an additional security because they were using the pool and opening up that gate at night. Tenant filed a complaint. A settlement was reached where the tenant was not paying for additional security because there was already security on the premises and they were able to use the pool after 10 o'clock at night. But you can't add extra addendums because of a person's disability. Some accessibility examples, again, is requiring residents um, an accessible parking space that will accommodate wheelchair equipped vans. Uh, a reasonable accommodation could include relocating and enlarging an existing space that will serve the van. So taking two spaces and then turning them into one accessible parking spot. Another example here, is a resident uses a scooter type of wheelchair, which is 38 inches in width, and they request a ramp to enter their ground floor unit. The ramp, which requested, must be at least 40 inches wide, gives a two inches on each side. It must have a slope of no more than 3%, and the landing at the front door, which opens outward, must be enlarged to provide adequate maneuvering space to enter the doorway. The changes must be provided even though they may exceed the usual specifications of salt alteration. And another example, a resident needs a ramp entrance to their ground floor unit to accommodate their wheelchair. They don't wish to move to an accessible unit. They like where they're living. The recipient must provide an accessible entrance at the resident's current unit unless it would Again, do that undue financial and administrative hardship or fundamental alteration of the program to do so. They would have to show an undue financial or administrative hardship or fundamental operation to their, their nature of their operation to change uh, and not provide that rank. And then we also have a resident with Quadrupelgia request replacement of a bathtub in their unit with a roll-in shower. Due to the location of existing plumbing in the building and the size of the existing bathroom, a plumber confirms that installation of a roll-in shower in that unit is impossible. The on-site manager should meet with the resident to explain why the roll-in shower cannot be installed and to explore alternative all accommodations with the resident. So that would show that there is that fundamental change to the operations. They would not be able to put that roll-in shower in place without a complete change of plumbing and everything else. So then you would have to start that talking process to figure out a different accommodation that can suit that person with that disability. Finishing up right along here so we can get to the questions. As I said, we would talk about how complaints and our mediation process work if you should have any issues. So when it comes to filing a complaint, a fair housing complaint with the Civil Rights Division, 
If you have a complaint filed against you, you will be notified of the allegation. You will likely, you it's not even likely, you will be invited to mediate, also called conciliation. If you decide not to mediate, you could file your answer that is in writing under penalty of perjury and may be amended at any time. Once a fair housing complaint is made, you have the option, as I said, to mediate, conciliate, and that process is open throughout the entire time of the investigation. Should you decide to come together and try to resolve the issue through mediation, the investigation will still continue at the same time as the conciliation is happening. And if conciliation does not work, the investigation will continue and finish out. And if conciliation works, then the investigation is then halted once a conciliation agreement is reached between the two parties. And speaking of that process, when it comes to mediation, conciliation, it is a free service. You do not have to pay for it. It does eliminate the lengthy investigation and litigation time. It, it does speed up a resolution of a complaint as there is no long investigation process. It does save time and money. It does open the lines of communications between the parties. An agreement is binding on both the complaint and the respondent. And everything that happens in mediation and conciliation is confidential. So anything that is brought to the table, anything that is said during conciliation is not part of public record and it is not part of the investigation. It, they cannot move any statements made in the conciliation over to the investigation site. And if a settlement is reached, it is not part of public knowledge. TDHCA for their funded properties have their own complaint process that Nathan will address. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> per 10 TAC, uh, section 1.2, the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs has a process to address complaints about its properties and programs. Within 15 business days, the complainant will receive a response from the department either that the complaint has been resolved or that it will be resolved by a certain date. After that, the complainant will be notified about the complaint at least quarterly until final resolution. Uh, in my experience, I've not seen many complaints that require uh, quarterly uh, notifications or qu quarterly updates. Most complaints are resolved before that, hap before that time frame. Um, and usually you hear from uh, TDHCA about your complaint much faster than 15 business days. That first uh, response is, is usually within just a, a couple of days. Uh, so if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, in the state of Texas, uh, about 60% of all fair housing complaints uh, are uh, based upon disability as the protected class. And within those, within that 60%, most, far, far more than any other uh, groups, are, among those are discriminatory terms and conditions, privileges, services, and facilities, or failure to make reasonable accommodations. Um, and that, that is based upon data from, in Texas from 2013 to 2018. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, substantive sample size there. Um, so it's reasonable accommodations are not rare. They are in fact quite common and they are also very common in fair housing complaints. Um, so it is important to make sure that you know you're handling uh, reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications properly so you don't end up um, you know having to deal with the Texas Workforce Commission Civil Rights Division because you've had a fair housing complaint against you. Um, you know, try to nip that in the bud and deal with it beforehand uh, rather than let it get to that point. So in that vein, if you have training or technical assistance needs, 
you can contact either the Texas Workforce Civil Rights Division. Uh, the information is there. Their number is 512-756-3949. And as Jeff stated earlier, the email address to reach out to is crdtraining at twc.state.tx.us. And for the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, you can reach out to me, Nathan Darris, at 512-475-0306. My email addresses are as follows. You can get to me at fair.housing at tdhca.state.tx.us. That second email address is going to be phased out here in the next few months. I'll still get those emails, but uh, you'll want to send them to fair.housing at tdhca.state.tx.us. So I think that we have gotten to the end of what we have uh, prepared. So we have some questions. Um, I wanted to hold off on some of these until the end because it looked like there was some, there were some patterns, uh, Jeff. So uh, one of the things that has come up is, um, you know, how often should uh, the need for a reasonable case, uh, reasonable accommodation be reviewed or re-verified? Um, or is there uh, any type of temporary disability that would not uh, allow for a reasonable accommodation? But a lot of the questions are um, to, to, you know, when can you review a reasonable accommodation to request to see if it is still necessary? So there is no specific time limit listed within the acts for that, that is going to be between that housing provider and that consumer. Now, again, if that is excessive, if you have a housing provider who is reviewing it monthly, could seem excessive and could potentially be interpreted by a consumer as discriminatory that this person is always looking at that. You could be opening yourself up for a complaint um, by having that. It's important to have, as a housing provider, to have policies, procedures, and, and regulations that are looked at as well internally. I would probably say every, you know, every year you were looking at your own policies and procedures for reasonable accommodations. And when you have a tenant who is requesting a reasonable accommodation request and is providing documentation if necessary, that could be part of the documentation and it could be also part of your interactive process with that tenant. Okay, this is a permanent disability, so we will never revisit this. Okay, this is a Temporary disability, but we know some temporary disabilities, one might be extended or that temporary disability might turn into a permanent. And you, if you have that interactive process, even though there is no specific timelines per any of the acts, you can have that interactive process and say, we will revisit this in six months or we will revisit your reasonable accommodation when your lease agreement is up for renewal would be for me, as good marks on the wall to see and what we've seen in the past, would be good timelines to establish for revisiting a reasonable accommodation or modification. All right. And then um, this is another one that we had a little bit of a uh, little repeat business on this question. So can a resident without a car request a parking space for someone who comes to help the resident weekly? Yes. And, and this works in, I can think of a, an example um, that we've seen that is similar in vain to this, but if you, you have a tenant whose mother who is in a wheelchair visits on a weekly basis and that 
tenant requests to build a ramp for his mother to get into his house without having to lift her upstairs. That modification, again, cannot be refused due to the nature. It would be similar into this one because you also have a person who is a, a person could be a caregiver um, or a guardian type person over an adult who is also assisting with that person and they drive a car. So you can request that reasonable accommodation to those policies, practices, procedures with your housing provider. And again, remember reasonable accommodations cannot be refused, but they can be denied, but they have to show that there is a fundamental change to that provider's operation or it's an undue financial or administrative burden. So they would be right in asking for that reasonable accommodation request of a parking space for their, did you say caregiver, I think? Well, it was, didn't, didn't stay, uh, state whether it was a caregiver, but for someone who comes to help the resident weekly. And I think the question was also whether or not the request for the spot would also be that it was a uh, a reserved spot. Now, if you're trying to get a reserved spot for a a person who does not live in that uh, that that complex, um, that there may not be a nexus there between the two. So, but to get a spot. Or a reasonable accommodation to ask for, you know, that person who comes weekly to to do you know, something along the line. Now, remember, there has to be, and I, you know, without knowing specifics of the situation, I, I come back to there has to be a nexus, a a reason, a disability, and a disability related need for a reasonable accommodation request. Uh, you, you can't just you know, there has to be something between the two. You can't just be like, I have a disability, but I'm going to ask for something that has nothing to do with it, um, because then there's not a nexus, a causation between the two. So I, I would default to that without knowing the specifics that you can ask for this accommodation if there is a nexus between the two. So I think the the another another way to put this might be that if we frame this, excuse me, as two different questions, um, one is can you request that uh, someone who does come to help you as a resident who has a disability on a, say, a weekly basis, request that this person who helps you be allowed to park uh, without being towed, right, if the property requires parking permits or something. Mm -hmm. That would be like a no, no-brainer, absolutely. Uh, you know, go ahead. That's probably a reasonable accommodation. Um, whereas if they are asking for a reserved spot for someone who comes weekly to help, that nexus is probably not there or maybe, uh, maybe a little more blurred. All right. I think that actually gets us to the end of our questions. Look at that, an hour and a half exactly from when we started. Uh, so again, if you have, if you have questions, um, if you have questions, go ahead and email them to us. We can roll back to the training and technical assistance slide to keep those up. Oh, you already did that, great. Um, I guess I did. Yeah. Um, we did have one more question come in. I'm going to try to read it real quick here to see if it's something we can answer. Okay. Oh, this is actually a good one. Um, does a landlord need to approve an accommodation to pay to maintain something in a home if the tenant cannot physically maintain it themselves and cannot afford to hire someone to maintain it? So that's a lot of ifs and ands. Um, yes, it is. Um, 
So, you know, I'm going to answer this by saying that this is probably something very specific. Um, so if there, there's got to be details that we're missing here because, you know, every situation is unique. Uh, go ahead and email us that question with more details and we can probably get you a better, a better answer. Uh, because as it is, I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, and I come back to with this one, you know, an accommodation is, you know, a change, an exception to rules, policies, or procedures. Um, I mean, it, it can involve pay. And there is a line between where we get into, you know, technical assistance to, to legal advice when it comes to what's in people's lease agreements and rental agreements that we really can't speak to. Um, I would say that the more that I'm reading this now, the more that it sounds like the request might be for something that the property is not usually in the business of. Um, so there could also be that, right? It, the request could be for something that would fundamentally alter the nature of the, the business provider or service provided. Um, so yeah, if you have specific situations, reach out to us by email. Um, that's going to be the best way for us to get you a more full answer. And the answer may be, we don't know, you might need to consult uh, legal counsel. Uh, because again, we are not attorneys and we can't give you specific legal advice. So I think that that is going to wrap it up for us today. Uh, remember that on Thursday, uh, we do have a webinar specifically about assistance animals, uh, then uh, that will also be at 2 p.m., the same as this one. Uh, so be on the lookout for the an email that comes from this webinar. It will have a link to register for the assistance animal webinar as well. And so we will see you all there, hopefully. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And Jeff, thanks for uh, presenting for us. Yes, thank you for having me. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you Thursday.